Thank you. Thank you. So my name is Claudio Perrone. I'm a Lean and Agile management consultant, entrepreneur. Uh, I'm also a developer. I'm building a digital platform in Clojure. And uh, today, though, I'm going to talk about something that is really dear to me, which is how to introduce change uh, in your teams and in organizations. Uh, oh, yeah, the last thing is I can draw, right? So I like to draw, so I draw cartoons and stuff like that. A lot of people, if I don't say it, ask me later, so I'll just tell you right away. Yes, I like to draw. So it'll be a bit of storytelling and everything. Anyways, why am I talking about something called popcorn flow? Well, first of all, I want to talk about the problem. And, uh, and the problem is this one, is inertia, our tendency to do nothing and remain unchanged. Inertia, my friends, is our enemy. Life is made of choices, but we don't choose very often. Yeah, we take the easy way. We create boxes for ourselves and others. It's the easy path and whatever. And so we drown, right? We drown due to our sleepwalking, the decisions we don't take. Again, what's comfortable, what's easy. And uh, we, we drown by our own inertia. We're victims, in fact, of our own inertia and inertia of others. And we're really like zombies. We're really like zombies. We live in zombie land. You look around, you're surrounded by zombies. The reason you don't, you don't see it is because they look like us. It's because it is us. And I think it's a, it's a human tragedy. Meanwhile, menacing waves are marching towards us, right? Uh, if the rate of change on the outside is greater than the rate of change on the inside, what happens? The end is near. And so we, did, we do live in turbulent times, and technology and society evolve faster than most companies' ability to adapt. And so, like you talk about new knowledge discoveries, legal rec rec regulatory changes, new trends, competition at global level, sophisticated customers, and so on, right? So it, things are really changing, this brave new world, right? And so I wonder, how can individuals and organizations move fast, learn faster, and thrive in this brave new world? How do we do that? See, the thing is, we want to improve, right? Do we want to improve? Yeah, I still spot some people who doesn't want to improve, but it's a bit worrying, right? But improvement without change is impossible. Improvement without change is impossible. I mean, it's straightforward, right? Who says it? Was that Einstein? No, somebody like you and me. In fact, it's me. I like to quote myself from time to time, <laughs> right? No, but seriously, <laughs> I mean, it's self-evident, right? We want to improve, you know, everybody happy. Well, we need to change. How do we do this, right? The thing is, though, that most of, most of us think about change as something big, like it's like Godzilla, right? And it's dangerous, and it is dangerous. When we look at, you know, most big transitions, big plans or whatever, you know, we plan like big changes from A to B, and, and it is huge. And so, you know, if you know about satire, you can see like this curve, you know, this big dip pretty much in productivity and everybody's scared until we find some enlightenment. And a lot of methodologies are actually based on these assumptions that we need to introduce big change. Um, but what if instead we could make it infinitely small? Instead of looking at Godzilla, let's look at something incredibly small, right? And the idea was, what if we learn to evolve fast, almost as fast as a virus, a microorganism. Okay, I learned somewhere, thing, you know, I learned somewhere that there are microorganisms that evolve every 15 minutes. Every 15 minutes, there's a new generation. I don't know if it's true. I mean, I read it somewhere, right? Super fast in, and uh, and I said, okay, that's kind of interesting. And so I had this kind of mad thought, a thought that can't possibly work, right? Which is this one: if change is hard. Make it continuous. Make it continuous. Right? And uh, if you think about that, particularly, you know, your developers, right? Uh, if you think about continuous, we, we learn about continuous, like, change in some way. You know, we know it as a form of continuous integration, right? In the olden days, you know, I'm old enough, we used to integrate, like, for, you know, we, we would build software, like, for a long time, and then we would integrate in the end. Right? So we would have time to add features and bugs, then we put them together, 
<laughs> right? And so there's a 90% done and a 90% yet to do, right? Because it's bloodbath, essentially. That's the time when you're ready with your CV, right? When you put things together. So somebody definitely more clever than I was, like said, well, if it is so hard, why don't we integrate a little bit more often? Maybe every six months? Then every quarter, you know, and then it became like monthly bills, then weekly bills, nightly bills, and now we have continuous bills, right? Or continuous delivery as well, right? So we write some code, goes automated tests, we get feedback right away. And because we changed a little, the damage we made is probably little as well, and we get immediate feedback. If we learned that for continuous integration, why don't we adopt it with change? Why do we do the big change all the time? Let's do it all the time. It should be easier. Right? So maybe it's not that mad. When I thought about that, I actually had as an inspiration Ken Beck, right? When he introduced extreme programming, like he talked about the, you know, you, you would turn pretty much the, the knob, right, to 10. And when I started, it, you know, essentially the idea was you bring some of these principles, you bring to extremes and see what happens. And I really want to be extreme with that. And when I started thinking about that, people said, oh, you haven't seen the movie. Spinal Tap, right? Under Marshall, they go to 11. I said, okay, I'll go to 12 then, right? Let's, let's try really to be extreme on this. And uh, now, with that, I could leave right now, and that would be the only advice I could give you, the principle. Just take whatever change you have and just split it up in small things. But of course, rewiring the human brain is not that easy. Just because I tell you, you should be a servant leader, like in the other world, doesn't make you a servant leader, right? So every time, like it's hard, there's a difference between what we tell people they should be doing and what they actually do. And so we can't rewire, rewire, rewire it. I should change the verb because I can't say it. <laughs> um, so a better option is to act on the system, which in this case is the environment in which we take decisions. Okay? This is not a battle of little problems, it's a battle of systems. In the same way, um, when you think about, say, waterfall versus flow, right? When you start talking about optimizing flow and you play with, you know, whatever, you actually see that there are physical laws at work that actually makes the focus on flow make you really faster. When I learned about Agile years and years ago, I was told a lie, and the lie was, the lie was, oh, Agile is about adapting to change, right? It's not about going fast. You get the requirements. The requirements may change over time, so we need a way to adapt. So we would take small batches and whatever. And then Lean came, because the thing was, right, if you really want to go fast, then you specialize, you work all together, use waterfall and whatever. That's the best practice, right? But in software, we can't really do it, so we do Agile. What can you do? Right? We are adapted. Until, actually, I learned about Lean and Flow and queuing theory, and I began to realize, wow, like if we keep the batches low, well, it's more, we go much faster. So not only we adapt, we actually go much faster. Right? There are some easy demonstrations to show that, which really shows that this is a battle of systems. Right? My performance may vary a little bit from yours, right? but within certain limits, it actually doesn't really matter. What really matters is the systems we are operating in. So with, right, so if you change the system, the entire team and organization works in a really different way, right? So it's good to think in terms of systems. Anyways, let's start on the system. And the question is out. So enter Popcorn Flow. Popcorn Flow captures a pragmatic, anti-fragile philosophy, which are, I articulate through a number of principles, which are kind of growing, but this is where I am so far. Uh, the first one you just met, if change is hard, make it continuous, the virus principle. The second one is, uh, it's not only what to do, but also what to learn by doing it that matters. The ladder principle, I explained then what it, what it means anyway. Everybody is entitled to their own opinion, but a shared opinion is a fact. I'm not saying don't quote me on this, I'm saying within the bounded context of fuck and flow, this is true. Okay? Uh, it's not fail fast, fail often, it's learn fast, learn often, small bets, big payoff. Okay? Those are just principles for now. Um, and then there's a decision cycle, a seven step decision cycle, which starts with problems and observations. Then we have options, 
possible experiments, committed, ongoing, review, next. The beginning of each step makes the word popcorn, hence the name popcorn flow. I'm a genius, right? <laughs> because before it was my way to do experimentation. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's cool, but it's Claudio's way, right? I change a couple of columns, now makes the word popcorn, and now everybody is talking about popcorn flow, right? As a thing. Now, I want to warn you. You learn the steps, like we, any method, it may be Scrum or whatever, right? You don't learn the principle. You need to start maybe with the actions, right? With the, with the steps and whatever, the method. If you understand the principles, you're not going to be slave of the method. If all you know is the method, you will always be slave of the method, okay? So start with the method, and then you, you start to begin to appreciate the, what the principles are, and once you internalize them, you're free to choose whatever you want. This is only a canonical way, essentially, of doing it so far in certain situations. Okay, and so, so we take those steps and we put them in a pack and flow board. Pack and flow board, if you have, if you use Scrum or Kanban, often you would have like a parallel board. Uh, if you don't, because maybe you're doing innovation or whatever, this is your board, okay? Um, and brings to the surface a learning stream. And uh, just to explain, you see, uh, it's not only what you do, but also what you learn by doing it that matters. Okay? It's not just reducing cycle time. It's how you do it. Are you reflecting on that? Right? In Agile, we're humble. Right? Agile is about being humble. If you knew the perfect way to develop software or producing a product or whatever, we would use the perfect way. We would put in a nice video, di video diagram, and that would be it. It's exactly because we don't know the perfect way that actually we start with what we know, we inspect and adapt, and we evolve. Okay? That's why context is important, because what works for me may not work for you, and so on. Right? But one thing I want to say, though, is the Park and Flow board brings to the surface a learning stream. Value stream and learning stream to the surface. They're like rails in a ladder. To make progress, you need both. Who are the heroes in firefighting companies? The firefighters. Why? Because all it's visible to the business is when they fix the problem. What happens to the teams who actually, everybody who's here, right? Who prevents problems to occur, right? They are under the radar. They're not the heroes because they are not seen, they are invisible. So what we do is we bring the Falcon Flow boards and we actually see how people reason, right? All these experiments and whatever. Let me go ahead. So it starts with problems and observations. Uh, you know, quality could improve, cues, risk, you know, whatever. Whatever way people express it. Um, it doesn't matter if it's a big or small, if it's a team level or even a company level. But it, we start with problems and observations. Uh, Morning, of course, which is what a lot of people do, rarely helps, right? So we talk a lot about problems. Uh, this friend of mine actually says, okay, so there's a different people, you know, I only moan and do nothing about it. I moan, but I'm unable to make my point with peers and management. I moan, although I know I'm wrong, <laughs> and uh, I did everything I could, but my peers and managers are idiots. Okay? <laughs> yeah, it all makes sense. Uh, but really, the way I look at it is that I see problems as an, as an entry point. There's a system, that's the status quo. I hack it. What's my entry point? Problems. To be honest, not mine, yours. If I agree with some of your problems, that's where I attack. Okay? So, for example, we could have a problem if you're like in a typical software development team and problems and observations. It could be something like this the quality of our code sucks. Okay? I could write a problem like that. Of course, Within the context of Far From Flow, a problem is not a problem. It's a perception that something is a problem, that you should agree that is a problem, and we should act on it now. It's a perception, okay? However, I put my name there, right? You see there, there's my avatar. The older I'm getting, the younger is getting. But, <laughs> but uh, so it's just to say, look, I might be wrong, but this is how I see the world. Right? And the thing, though, to be to inertia, I'm happy to make progress even with imperfect information. So I don't claim this is scientific at all. Right? <laughs> you want the facts and everything. I think it's BS, right? because in a lot of cases, you can't demonstrate a lot of stuff. And yet, I can actually have an expression and actually say, I think the code sucks. Do you agree? Right? So everybody is entitled to their own opinion, including me. 
Uh, but the shared opinion is a fat. Is it a real fat? No. Within the context of Falcon Flow, a fat is a perception. It's a pseudo fat. We'll treat it as a fat for now. And we may be wrong, we may be biased, we may be terribly wrong, but we, we're going to do fast cycles and eventually converge to the truth. We will challenge the same problems that we have. And I call it the freedom principle because it gives me freedom to express what I actually feel about this. So the quality of our code sucks. If you guys agree, then I drop my avatar or people put their own avatars, whatever, we all agree. Or we don't vote, right, on whatever we feel is the highest problem. So, um, and then what I do is I use shared observations to create and elicit options. L rule of three, right? If you have one option, you have no options. Two, you have a dilemma. Three or more, you have a world of possibilities. Satire. Satir. Uh, so the rule of three. What could be within, in this case? Well, it could be, I don't know. We could do, we know what we could do, right? Code review. Uh, it could be BDD. It could be test-driven development. It could be pair programming. Right? Those are all coherent. We feel they are coherent. We may be wrong. You can see that in hindsight. But we feel, as a team, these are coherent with the problem we have. What I'm seeking here is agreement on the problem, not on the options. We can violently disagree on options, right? But we can explore maybe one or more of those. So, like in this case, even if I was a team lead and I said to, to my team, from now on, we shall use test-driven development or pair programming until death will separate us. What do you think will happen? Right? Some will love it, <laughs> some will resist it. Right? So probably that's not a good way. So these are strategies we can adopt. We didn't commit to any of those. We are keeping them open, but we could begin to explore it. How do we do that? Through experiments. A little experiment, a small step in that direction to explore one of more options. So it could be, I don't know, uh, uh, well, one, we could, we could explore maybe a couple of BDD scenarios. Uh, the other one could be maybe you and I could pair program for three days, right? He says, yeah, it's too easy, right? If you say three days, how about three hours, right? It could be shorter, shorter, shorter. You know, when you make it really short, you're essentially creating, limiting the barrier to introduction, right? Because we agreed on the problem. Okay, as long as we agree on the problem, now we begin to see that there are options. Maybe I may not completely disagree with an option, but I'm willing to explore an experiment, right? Through by an experiment. And so it could be literally that at the end of that, we make it a real experiment. My expectation is that I like it, you like it. Our perception, if we can't test it, that's fine, but our perception is the quality of our code improved and that we want to continue afterwards. I can ask you at the end of the three days or three hours, right? How do, how do you feel about this? So that's really a tangible little experiment, right, that you can actually do. And uh, now remember, I'm not using the scientific method. It's, it's more about complexity here, right? But the experiment at the end, pass or fail doesn't really matter because I, I didn't prove anything. What I proved is that I explored that option and perhaps it's a viable one, okay? So anyway, um, Let's continue. Oops, it doesn't click for some reason. Uh, let me go back. Yeah, so those are our worst things. So experiments we commit to pursue have an action, a reason, an expectation, and a review date. Okay, when are we going to review it? Tomorrow or in four days from now, we're going to review it. Or maybe at the retrospective if you're, if you're doing it on a cadence rather than just in time. We do both, right? And at the end of that, we always ask these questions. What experiments we agreed to do? Which ones did we actually do? Reality kicks in. What was the expectation? What's reality based on this gap? What did we learn? Maybe there's other stuff that we learned. Based on that, move it. What are we going to do next? Okay, and it's very systematic. It's a protocol. Um, okay, so, you know, when we start actually with this, some people fear, right? They fear that these experiments may fail. And so they call the gap between an expectation and reality frustration. <laughs> you know, they get frustrated if we don't get to that. But I call, actually, let me just click like that. But we really fail when we fail to learn, when we fail to set our opportunities for learning. The gap between not so much expectation, but what I anticipate will happen and reality is the actual learning. In fact, a lot of my experiments fail to meet my own expectations. If I don't fail often enough, probably I'm not daring often enough. 
it's exactly when I fail that I actually start thinking, uh, why? You know, we're capable of wonderful thinking. We don't think very often. <laughs> and if we always succeed, we still don't think, right? We d but it's when that, that doesn't happen that we start thinking. Okay, besides, can you really learn if you're not prepared to fail? Has anybody done skateboarding at all? Uh, some people, yeah. You, one thing you learn with skateboarding is that people will laugh at you. People will laugh with you, right? But they will respect you if you actually try whatever trick you try, right? The only people who never fail are the ones who are sitting on the bench looking at their life passing by, okay? So, you know, as we say, like in Lean Startup, we say fail fast, fail often. It's not really fail fast, fail often. It's learn fast, learn often, okay? Can you learn boxing? You know, there's a guy who did a some series of you know training in boxing and said, yeah, yeah, Claudio, that's right. You can't not learn boxing if you're not prepared to take a punch. <laughs> right? You can't learn surfing if you're not prepared to get wet, right? There's plenty of examples in life, right? But of course, all these experiments need to be failed to, uh, safe to fail, right? There are sometimes they are not safe to fail, right? And so you launch a number of experiments that instead are that lead to that particular maybe event. So the, the reality is that rather than survive uncertainty, we want to exploit it, right? And uh, crucially, Taleb says, you know, some things gain from disorder, right? Rather than being damaged by that. And there is an asymmetry test. So anything that has more upside than downside from random events or certain shocks is anti-fragile. And the reverse is fragile. So a fragile thing, you take a glass of water, a glass anyways, you, you give some external shock and you will soon end up uh, with the problem of breaking. That's fragile. But the opposite of fragile is not, is not robust. Robust means it's like a dam, right? It doesn't matter what external shock I put, the dam up to a certain point resists and remains the same. What we really want is to shake the thing, right? And actually to even improve. What examples do we have here? Well, we look at nature and we see, for example, that if we exercise, you know, we, we get stronger, right? Why? Because the body gets the shock and then overcompensates, and as a consequence of that, we become better and better. Okay, and so the thing is about small bets and big payoffs. All right, so we're talking about options, but also small bets, not big bets, small bets, big payoff. Let me give you an example. So this participation to this conference uh, is an example on how you can use variability, option asymmetry, and time to your advantage. So for example, um, this or others may be good quality sessions for you. They could be actually a good quality, good speaker, good topic, but the value to you may be nil, right? Because you're doing something else in your life. You're not prepared for that, okay? And so it really doesn't matter, you know, uh, what speaker you have and what topic you have, right? You made a bet to come here. You had options, right? You had options. I'm grateful that you came here, like, in great numbers, right? So you had the options. Now the doors are closed, so you're mine. Options expire. <laughs> you know, you committed to this, right? But the thing was, you made a bet based on the title, based on the description, based on whatever. And it's a bet, which may or may not have paid off. But the thing, if you think about that, is a small bet, right? Because your cost is the time that you put, maybe the cost of the conference and so on, but it's a small bet. At worst, you've wasted some time. And in fact, other may not be so lucky, right? And again, it could be a fantastic, from the quality point of view, can be absolutely fantastic. But from, from your point of view, may not be that useful. So you may consider that a bet that didn't pay off. And so on, you can have a number of those. Again, the cost is limited. And look, some passed and some fails. The thing, though, is I can fail 10 times. But if then I get the black swan, there's maybe the 11th time where that particular talk, that particular topic, that particular meeting with that person changed my career. That's a black swan, right? So in your case, if we take this specific situation, you're anti-fragile, 
on the possibility that the randomness of different speakers coming from this company, from different, from psychology behavior, whatever Benjamin is doing, I don't know, but it always makes me think, right? Did you rate his session if you've been that awesome, right? So the thing is like, it's exactly that randomness that we need. What we tend to do instead, we tend to make things simpler to keep in our mind, right? So the opposite of complexity, uh, you know, we try to make sim things simpler for us, and so we have this scale framework to so just fragilize whatever we're building, right? So anyways, so there's potential for a huge payoff. And right from the beginning, I knew the power flow was different because I saw once troubled teams being able to handle five to 10 change experiments every week. Not all teams, right? We're talking about three to five experiments a week typically, but even 10 small experiments to change and improve the way that works. Quickly negotiate change and converge to success. So let me give you just a couple of experiments at team level, right? Um, um, like, so for example, this is actually literally the first team I started um, trying this, where effectively it was a large distributed team, well, not large, but a distributed team that had a lot of politics going on. There were a lot of issues, right? Um, and, and so what they did was, anyways, they hired new people. And so we had the clash of cultures, right? You have the team who actually, the existing team who says, you know, if something is, is not broken, you know, we don't touch it. We don't touch the existing code. Well, this is a bug, we should touch it, right, for example. So there's a clash of the new blood pretty much wanting to introduce a lot of change, the old guys not wanting to introduce change. This can go over and over forever, right? So what they did instead was they actually negotiated a little experiment. They realized what one of the problems we could all agree with was uh, the bureaucracy, right? And so here's the reason, too much bureaucracy for small bugs. And somebody suggested, how about if we find a small bug, we just fit, uh, a, sm a small bug, we just fix it, right? And we don't go through like whatever. Anyways, this could have been gone on and on. Instead it was a little experiment, I think it was one week, maybe two weeks. And, um, and within the context they tried it, they liked it, and so that was good. Now fast forward a couple of weeks, new experiment goes on. And they said, okay, how about our product owner is always here, we may just as well uh, not do spring planning using Scrum or whatever, we're moving towards just in, we're just in time, so how about we do some just in time analysis? Essentially, when we are ready, we just talk to the product owner and we talk about you know, the next feature to build. There's a delay on commitment on actually what features to build, but overall, again, the reason was, uh, you know, well, in this case, you know, they wanted to reduce the spring planning or whatever. And again, they did it, right? They wrote their expectations. Uh, there was no big deal, uh, so they did it. They succeeded and said, okay, great. Fast forward again. Now we have the product owner who says, guys, before I was using Scrum with point estimation and whatever, I could actually plan my way through. Uh, now I have a problem. <laughs> you know, how, how am I going to know, you know, how can I have some form of predictability? And, uh, and so, what they did, the experiment was simply a meeting, a meeting where they would explain essentially how the metrics in whatever tool they were using back then would actually work. And so they used no estimates, which essentially is let's count the cards, you know, as, as Dan North actually was explaining uh, before, right? So anyways, if you think about that, from where the team started before, in fact, the team started that for months they couldn't deliver anything, which put actually the company in trouble. Okay, they couldn't deliver anything. They started negotiating pretty much change, and they started launching a, a number of experiments like this. And literally, these guys went from five to 10 experiments a week. Okay, so what I realized was, so, so they, stopped, they actually stopped from delivering from not delivering at all to delivering multiple times a day, right? They use continuous delivery and so on. Um, I consider popcorn flow a little bit like an alien technology. Okay, it's like, uh, do you know like um, Total Recall, the movie, the Schwarzenegger version, the one after was totally crap, right? So that one, right? So that's it, bam, alien technology to do what to terraform. What I find is this, right? There's virus-like patterns that are emerged, emerging because you, what you find is uh, these boards are 
very visible, right? They attract a lot of people. But then there are other patterns, essentially, that emerge, and they're virus-like. You know, that's mitosis, right, where the team splits. You create a dominant mindset within a, boundary con a, a bounded context, because I can't change the entire organization, so I design a bounded context within that. That's where we introduce the new approaches. You know, there is thing, the thing about culture is it's just like a shadow, right? You can't act on the culture directly, so what you do is you act on the behavior. Right? There, there is a misunderstanding here that in order to change the behavior, we need to change the thinking and the mindset. And what I'm saying, and I'm not the only one who says it, is that actually to do that, what you do is you change the behavior first, and then that behavior leads to new values and new mindset. Okay? And it's a little bit like... Uh, uh, something I saw a, a while ago about the elevator. Have you seen? There was a candy camera, like ages ago, right? That I've seen. And the candy camera essentially has got one victim, and everybody else is an actor. They enter the elevator, and all the actors turn their body on one side of the wall. And the guy looks <laughs> around and does the same. Then they turn the opposite side of the, world, the wall, and he does the same. Or maybe the guy's got a hat. They have a hat too, right? They enter the elevator. They all put the hat and it does the same. What I learned there was that we are all, we're all different, but we're powerfully influenced by the environment that surrounds us. And, to, and so it is our responsibilities as leaders, fathers, mothers, to create those conditions to allow people and that behavior essentially to emerge. This is what I'm trying to do with Park on Flow, right? We're, we're creating specific elevator-like <laughs> bounded context, and within that, there are certain rules, some uh, constraints, I guess, uh, that, that we place to create a particular behavior. Okay, um, I'm actually going to do a workshop tomorrow, so if you want to know some more of these patterns, that maybe is an option. I love options here, right? But the thing is then, is to really terraform organizations. I see organizations, a lot of them are are like Mars, right? They are in inhabitable. <laughs> I don't know how people can cope with that, right? They're, they're really hard. And so what you do is, instead of oxygen here, what we have is popcorn <laughs> you know, popping out. Each experiment at the beginning is really hard, and then it becomes easier and easier and easier. So imagine a continuous flow of experiments to accelerate the rate of change in every corner of your organization. This is not just software development. Marketing is using it. Uh, decision making on boards, you know, there's a, there's a lot of usages essentially because it's about decisions and life is made of decisions. So how far would you go? Well, that first customer I work with, uh, they said the change to their business has been transformational. Last year, their company grew the revenue by a factor ten. I, I'm not saying that this would happen everywhere. I'm just saying this is the potential of what we are talking about here. Okay, and of course I helped. Now, today, Popcorn Flow is entering more organizations, and uh, it's fast and lightweight decision cycle, so it can be higher to get many jobs done, right? I know why I build it. I sometimes get really surprised on how people, what people hire it for, right? how they use it. And until I realized it's because it's about decisions, it was until then that I really struggled to understand why it would work in so many situations. So you can think about... Uh, Agile teams, for example, a lot of them, they would use a Park and Flow board to conduct their retrospectives. Why? Because we always end up with experiments, right? We start by reviewing the experiments, and then we launch new experiments. Or they put the experiments just in time, and they use the retrospectives to review them, right? So they, they use it for, say, operational excellence. Uh, but then we use it as well for innovation. So, you know, there's a lot to be said about Agile as a delivery system. There's very little to talk about, about Agile in terms of the fuzzy front end. I learned more about Agile from Lean Startup, right? Innovation accounting. You know, there are companies, including myself, right? What you look at is how to increase the conversion rate from X to Y. You know, what features are we building that would improve that? Or what kind of activities are we going to do to improve that? Or retention or the growth engine, or whatever, okay? So you begin to think like in terms of what comes before. It's not just the operational excellence stuff. Right? Excellence uh, stuff. Um, 
And then people said, oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, there's banks who use it. Uh, there's a company I can't name who use it for uh, coming up with options for self-driving cars. So, I mean, like a lot of technology like that. Um, and somebody said, oh, yeah, Claudio, but this stuff, you know, people are motivated differently. Uh, this would work in the private sector. It wouldn't work on the public sector. So I went to Canada. I worked with 16 different agencies. Uh, within uh, government agencies, within an hour and a half, they generated, there were 120 people. They generated, we did a workshop. They generated 97 experiments and committed to 65 to do on Monday. They called me the tornado of Ottawa, right? Uh, so there is like there is hope for everybody because we want to do great. We want to be put in the conditions to do great things And I believe this actually helps you maybe to create those conditions those starting conditions um, And then Park and Flow is touching lives even outside the business world um, This is my son uh, At the time of this story he wasn't yet seven so I came from I was in portal I came back and and he was very frustrated, right? And so that's the way he expressed this problem. I want to sell snails. Mommy says that nobody would buy snails. I like snails. I want to sell them, right? Mommy says nobody would like to buy them, but she doesn't know that. And I thought about that, and I said, you know what? She's, you're right. She doesn't know that. So let's play the park and flow game, right? He started playing with park and flow when he was five. There's a YouTube video at five when he explains park and flow level one. There's problems, options. <laughs> Ongoing done, no review, I mean, it just didn't get that yet, right? So now we were actually doing this, and all I did was to facilitate the conversation. I didn't put any option there. So I asked, okay, so based on that, I agree, what options do we have? And within an hour and a half, he generated 16 options. Sorry, an hour, he generated 16 options. Only kids could do that, right? We can't. I always say, you know, three options, five options, but 16, right? I couldn't stop it. I was typing furiously, right? I could ask everybody I know. It was very embarrassing for mommy. I sell snails to all their friends. Uh, I sell snails, do you want to buy them? And so on. I could create a YouTube video. Uh, I can uh, do a snails ride, uh, um, you know, a cake with the shape of a, sna of a, of a snail. Anyways, like number of options, literally 16. I, I didn't have space to keep it readable and show you all, right? And he kept saying, you know, I could give up, I'll never give up. <laughs> said it three times, I said, well, look, <laughs> I burned $15 million <laughs> of investors' money with that thinking. <laughs> you know, I could give up, I'll never give up. <laughs> so you kind of need to get the feedback from the outside, right? <laughs> That's what I learned in Lean Startup, at least, right? You're not an entrepreneur if you're not opinionated, right? But maybe you should listen to the market. Back then, you know, the model wasn't there yet, or at least I wasn't aware of it. And so, anyways, so we said, okay, what option can we start to explore first? Uh, and so we started with the first experiment. Um, unfortunately, it didn't bring the results that we hoped for. He did his YouTube video. You can actually click and see it. Um, we had 36 views at the time I took that screenshot. But his expectation, in fairness, was that people would knock at the door you know, to buy his nails. It was all about what they eat and whatever. So that obviously bombed, but it was, you know, it was awesome. But the next one, you know, I actually had high hopes for, for, for the next one. Uh, let's see if it works. It was definitely more promising, right? So he put a sign outside the door, snails for sale. You see, sale, like a ship sailing. I didn't want to change that. It was so romantic. I just lef left it. Uh, with that, I had hopes. In fact, a couple of kids uh, knocked at the door, and you know they wanted to. You know, they actually asked, "Are you really selling snails?" Yes, everything one euro. You know, with with the with the house, without the house. Can we see them? Do you have the money? <laughs> <laughs> they never came back. And then, you know, I'm Italian, I live in Ireland, Ireland it rains all the time, and so like, it started raining, the sign went down, like, it was a disaster, right? So I talked to, to Matteo and I said, well, look, maybe mommy was right, you know? Maybe it's really hard to sell snails because everybody's got a back garden around here. We have tons of snails, <laughs> it just happens. And so every kid with a back garden would have snails. So maybe, and we don't live in France, so they don't eat them, so, you know. 
So anyways, the point being was maybe that's not the right way. Uh, maybe it should be something around, you know, uh, maybe it could be something different, snail-related, but, but not snails. Uh, maybe you could do a drawing. And he said, Daddy, I have a better idea, right? And first of all, no matter who and how he asked, nobody wanted to buy his nails, what would you do? He kept doing that. I'll never give up. Okay, so decided to explore a new option. He said, I'm not going to do a drawing, I'm going to do a comic book. And I want you to be involved because I don't want you to miss on the phone. And you know, as you see, I like a little bit of storytelling. We used to do stories when he was really young for a number of reasons. We would take index cards and you know, we'd start with an index card, create a scenario, and then, and then what happens? And he would tell me what's next. And then what happens? So we would literally create stories like that. One thing I forgot, by the way, is my son is Asperger. Right? Asperger is one of those, is the perfect project manager. Right? <laughs> Needs to be in control of everything. Right? He works really well with things, not so well with people. Right? So I use actually the Power Flow board to manipulate him, right? which is fair game, right? because he manipulates me all the time. <laughs> so instead of actually having him decide everything, we co-design these experiments. Right? We start about problems, we agree on that, and then we co-design. Interesting thoughts. Hmm? OK, so he decides to explore this option, which is I will make a comic book, a story about snails, I will sell it for 5 euro. No, 4.99. You know, of course, the iPad you know, generation, I guess. Uh, and then he asks, is it a good price? So he wanted to physically draw a comic book and sell that physical copy for 5 euro. Right? And he wanted to do 100 pages. <laughs> OK, I don't know if it's a good price, but I did something different. So anyways, we, we started um, by creating this adventure. I mean, it literally was, uh, you know, he knows what a turning page is, right? A turning point. So, uh, you know, it was a sunny day in Snail City until they get like lightnings and the entire city gets to be destroyed. And so they find themselves in this journey to actually find out who did it. Right? Who was the, the culprit, pretty much, of this thing? And so they go through the forest, they go through the jungle, they go through, uh, they take a ship until they land in the danger zone. Da da da, to be continued at page four. <laughs> at page four. So I scanned it. I mean, we worked on the dialogues and whatever. I scanned it and uh, I put it online. All the four pages. Free, available. And, uh, and I said to, uh, you know, and then on Facebook, like in the evening, I said, oh, these are the very first steps of entrepreneurship of my son, because that landing page was actually a donation page. Do you want to know how the story continues? Me too. If you donate, <laughs> I'll continue. I'll send you the updates, right? And uh, so anyways, he goes to bed. He lost a tooth. I'm not making it up. That evening, he lost a tooth. So he woke up, the tooth fairy gave him five euro, right? And then, and then in, uh, th this actually is for his, his MVP. Now you see actually there is a donation amount. Uh, there's also 50% goes to the school. 50% of the process. That was mommy idea. I think it's a stupid idea, right? 50% is way too much. As an entrepreneur, I really don't get that. But anyways, <laughs> I really don't, right? But anyway. Um, so, so he did it. So he goes to bed in his sleep, 20 euro, right? Passive income. And then 48 hours later, he's 91 euro too. I think now he's at uh, 170 or something like that, right? Uh, for a long time, I actually begged people to visit his landing page. I mean, it was embarrassing. I had to do this presentation to show the page you know, to go to. And one of, now the thing was, attention now, one out of six, his conversion rate was 17 that 24, right? If it was real, I mean, let's be honest, this is people who know me, friends and family. More friends than family. I have some, you know, problem with the family. They didn't contribute as much, right? <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> right? Um, but that's the thing, right? And, um, and so, so anyways, this is what happened. So much so that he said, uh, you know, Daddy, you told me once that when you were a kid, you... Uh, you, you did actually sell something to your peers. And in fact, I did, right? It was a kind of a, it was a stupid thing like that I did, you know, to encrypt like messages and whatever. And I did sell it across my, and, and he said, how old were you? Oh, I don't know, 10? I knew where this was going. <laughs> how much money did you make? <laughs> I don't know, 20 euro, including inflation? 
isn't it amazing that I'm not even seven and I, fi I already figured out a way to me? <laughs> right. What I really want to say, though, is that continuous evolution is a way of life because as you start running experiments, not only changes the environment around you, it changes you. So if we are surrounded by zombies, and it's not against people, it's it, is inertia, okay? Then you become a mutant. I like this idea of X-Men or X-Women or X-something, X-Mutant, fighting Zombieland, <laughs> in, in Zombieland. Mutants exist uh, and are among us. Every single week, I said once to a CIO who actually saw the transformation, and I said, you don't understand, every single week, I personally run about five, five experiments. I'm five experiments older than you. I said, every single week. My friend, when you die, how old do you want to be? Two experiments old or 20,000? Now, don't make your calculation. You can't possibly make 20,000 <laughs> experiments in a lifetime. But that's the mindset, OK, is to con continuously launch experiments and try to find new ways to, to change the environment. Because you see, the systems that we face are not the result of some stellar rule, right? It's not something that we can never change, right? It's not like some rule of the universe. These are systems created by humans, and by humans shall be destroyed if they are no longer fit for service. And then I started thinking, what if Pac on Flow could enable friendly strangers to affect global change? That's the platform I'm building right now. And I'm crazy enough to dare. You know, if there is one thing I would like you to take from that talk is go to that link global change, right? This is about things like eliminating extreme poverty by 2030. It's been already been halved. It can be done, but it can't be done with the normal thinking. We need to think about new ways. And I hope and think that Parkland Flow may help in that direction. And uh, my final thought is the following. Uh, in times of change, Learners inherit the earth, while the learned, the ones who actually know it all or think they know it all, they'll find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. As I said before, we do live indeed in turbulent times. It is indeed a brave new world, and it's awesome. Because once you understand that variability, it can actually use to, to be used to your advantage. Then not only you don't fear change, but you go to Australia to actually to ride the biggest waves, right, where the opportunities are. And with this, I thank you. Right? Um, next is now. I love options. You have options. <laughs> OK. <laughs> thank you. And remember, not only to vote on the previous session, but perhaps even this one. Thank you so much.